Great, thank you. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's an, an honor to be here to help celebrate um, your anniversary. So I'm going to be jumping, as Emily said, to the very high redshift universe to talk about um, some of what we've learned over the first now, uh, it says a year, really should be two years of uh, JWST observations since it's about the two year anniversary of getting the data. So just to spend a few minutes to set the stage, uh, there were a lot of questions we had as we entered the JWST era, specifically in the high redshift community. We wanted to know what is the evolution of the UV luminosity function. So I'll show you in a minute. We had spent a lot of time arguing over what was happening at redshift 8 to 10, and that was really because that was incredibly difficult to do with Hubble, what's happening at higher redshifts. If we can find galaxies at these very high redshifts, times less than 500 million years from the Big Bang, what are they like? We might expect that at some point we should find galaxies with extremely low metallicities. When do those appear? What are the masses? What are their properties? Um, also being able to look out to the red with JWST lets us look at the rest frame optical and maybe even the rest frame near infrared if you're using MIRI. And that begs the question, how accurately were we measuring stellar masses before? Were we way off or were we pretty close? And finally, it was kind of a, a, a maybe a more minor point for me, but it's now a huge field, which is supermassive black holes at high redshift. When and how did these actually form? And as I'll show you a little bit, and we'll hear more of, I'm sure, later this week, uh, they're really abundant in JWST data. So uh, one plot to sort of, sort of summarize where the field was before JWST is this plot of the star formation rate density from the Medallion Dickinson Review in 2014. Um, and this shows sort of the characteristic shape starting today, going into the past, there's a rise in the cosmic star formation rate density, reaches a peak about 10 billion years into the past, and then falls off towards earlier times. This was in about 2014. That was right around the time uh, Hubble was doing lots of wide field camera three surveys, allowing us to really measure this quantity at redshift of seven and eight precisely for the first time, and for those brave enough to try to push this to higher redshifts. And when we update this to look at what's happening at redshift of eight, nine, and 10, again, with Hubble before GWST, there was some disagreement. Some people thought they found sort of a continued smooth decline, that's that blue line, as you sort of fit a curve from much of four to eight and extrapolate that to higher redshift, it fits what some groups saw. Other groups saw they saw evidence of an accelerated decline. So a paucity of galaxies at redshift greater than eight, which, was, um, which would result in not much to see with JWST unless you went ultra deep. So before we get to JWST, it's worth at least touching base why did we disagree? We're using the same data sets. You might wonder why we disagree. And the real answer is Hubble was, was not built to do this. So this is a, a combination of luminosity functions I put together way back in 2016. This is showing redshift 8, lots and lots of data points. Once we get out to redshift 10, we're just kind of running out of galaxies. And so you could fit any number of curves through these data points, and that might explain some of the differences. One reason, or the reason why this was so hard, is again the limited wavelength range of Hubble. So this is showing a spectrum of a redshift zero star forming galaxy. This is a model. All kinds of cool features you can see at redshift zero and the observed UV optical and near infrared. Once you get out to redshift of 10, that's the red spectrum, you lose almost all of it. And in particular, if you look at the wavelength range that Hubble can access, this is the Hubble H band here. This is a real redshift 10 galaxy candidate. You only see it in one filter. So it's incredibly difficult to find these galaxies. You spend lots and lots of time convincing first yourself and then your readers that your sample is pure, and maybe we threw out some real high redshift of galaxies trying to be ultra complete, or maybe our samples were sort of swamped and that skewed our results as well. And of course, now that we can go to JWST, with just near cam alone, you access the full one to five micron regime. That gets you out to the bomber break at a redshift of 10. As you go to higher redshifts, you start to lose some wavelengths, but if you go ultra deep with MIRI, you can start to recover some of that. So most of what I'll talk about today comes from two surveys. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is the Cosmic Evolution Early uh, Release Science Survey, or SEERS. This is one of the 13 ERS programs. We've already heard about a few different ones um, just so far in this meeting. SEERS was sort of designed to be the, the proof of concept of doing coordinated parallel surveys in blank fields for high redshift galaxies. So all the SEERS observations use two instruments at a time, and the base was a 10-pointing near-cam uh, uh, mosaic. So what I'm showing up here in gray, that is one of the candles fields. Candles is one of these HST legacy fields where lots and lots of data, lots of time has been poured into. Gray is showing you the Hubble outline. We had to observe where Hubble observed because uh, we thought, turned out we didn't need to, but we thought we had to use Hubble sources for our near spec survey. So in blue, that's showing our 10 near cam pointings. In red is showing our originally six, but through some complications, we ended up with more near spec pointings. And in green shows our eight MIRI pointings. So we collected data with a lot of different instruments, 
Um, lots of uh, uh, different wavelength coverages, even different resolutions. We did spectra with both near spec and with near cam, really designed to provide kind of a sampler platter for the galaxy evolution community to um, be able to do galaxy evolution research. Um, lots of, of work has gone into this. I just want to acknowledge um, Mick Bagley, Noor Perskal, Guang Yang, and Pablo Arbal Harrow, who sunk years of their lives now into learning first how to run the pipeline well before the data even came out using simulated data, and then really improving on the basic pipeline. Uh, we have a website, sears.github.io. We have data releases of all of our data there. We also provide um, pretty advanced, well-documented Jupyter notebooks if you want to learn how we reduce the data. So I encourage you to go there. Uh, we're working on our final data release soon. I have our final near-cam mosaic. It's beautiful. It's about 0.2 magnitudes deeper than our previous one. That's just improvements in data reduction alone. The second survey I'll briefly mention is NGDeep. This is another cycle one survey. This is a 126-hour large program doing a deep near-cam imaging field in parallel to a deep nearest slitless spectroscopic field. And I'll just uh, briefly show you uh, part of our near cam field. This is actually just half of our data. We now have all of our data in. Looks even more beautiful. This work has been led by Gene Lung. And in a minute, I'll show you some of the high redshift galaxies that Gene has found. OK, so jumping out to the early universe, what can we find? This is a compilation of galaxies in the Sears field that uh, just got published actually a few weeks ago, finally now in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. It's showing a full sample of 88 high redshift galaxies detected in the Sears survey. This is redshift greater than 8.5, about 30 or so at redshift greater than 10. All of the squares in this plot have been spectroscopically confirmed. So you can be right to ask, these are photometric candidates. How robust are they? For the most part, photo Z's stand up pretty well. I'm highlighting one of the first discoveries on Maisie's galaxy, mostly to remind me to tell you that her birthday was yesterday. As it reminds me that yesterday is the two year anniversary of discovering this galaxy. So I owe her a big apology that I'm here with you instead of home with her. So I'll get back to her soon enough. And that is one of the confirmed ones at redshift 11.416. All right. So of course, we want to understand how this galaxy population compares to theoretical predictions. And what I'm showing you here is number of galaxies at redshift greater than z. So it's kind of a cumulative redshift plot. And this is a surface density. So number of galaxies per unit area on the sky. Each curve here is a different model pre-launch. So before anybody got to look at the redshift greater than 10 universe, what did the theorists think? And they thought a lot of things. Um, this reminds me of a plot we see in Texas quite a bit. These are these hurricane spaghetti diagram plots where you know where the hurricane's going to be tomorrow. But if you want to know where it's going to be next week, it could be anywhere from Mexico to Louisiana. And that's kind of where we were at. We did not have observations of the redshift greater than 10 universe, so predictions were kind of all over the map. That's OK. What happens when we get observations? This gray swath here shows what we observe. Kind of the shading range indicates our uncertainty. And you can see. We're finding lots of galaxies, and it's at the high end of all of these theoretical predictions. So broadly speaking, and this is not just true of Sears, this is now coming out in most JWST high ridges surveys, we're finding more galaxies than expected from theoretical models pre-launch. Let's look at um, empirical predictions. So this is now showing in blue the redshift 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 UV luminosity functions. These are just fits to observe data. These are redshifts we could do fairly well with Hubble. And if you extrapolate that, assuming a smooth evolution to redshift 11, this is that gray line here. So that's kind of a baseline. Empirically, what might we expect to see? This is what we do see, where the circles come from Sears and the squares come from NGD. And so you can see that not only is the observed abundance of galaxies higher than theoretically predicted, it's also higher than um, empirically predicted. These are just showing some of those theoretical model luminosity functions here as well. All right, so we'll look at this evolution in a different view. That previous uh, plot was just redshift 11. We also computed luminosity functions at redshift 9 and redshift 14. And again, this blue shading here is empirical. So the dark blue, this is what we have observed at redshift 3 to 9. And the light blue is if you extrapolate it to higher redshift. This is now looking at the abundance at just a fixed UV magnitude, fairly bright, minus 20, kind of sort of close to the characteristic magnitude. So you might expect if it was the smooth evolution scenario, we would follow this line. If it was the accelerated decline scenario, we would go below the line. But in fact, we see something different. There we go. There's some numbers there. But we'll show the actual data. The evolution is slower than what was expected. So it's not accelerated decline. It's not smooth decline. It's, uh, I like to call it a shallowing decline. Um, and I just want to point out that you might think a redshift 14 data point is ridiculous. This is based on three photometric candidates in Sears. This is actually showing our redshift 14 UV luminosity function. These are not confirmed, but as I'm sure we'll hear from Andy in the next talk, there are two redshift 14 galaxies that are confirmed. 
from the Jade's team. So I would love to confirm these, and maybe we will with a survey I'll talk about at the end. Um, so you can take that data point with a little bit of grain of salt from Sears, but I think we're seeing from other surveys um, that these things do indeed exist. All right, so mid-talk, I don't know if I meant mid-talk, but we'll call it the mid-talk summary, um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So the abundance of galaxies at redshift greater than 10 from Sears and NGD is tracking higher than most pre-launch predictions, as well as uh, empirical extrapolations. And again, we're seeing neither an accelerated decline nor a smooth decline, but a, a slowing or a shallowing decline. Um, so why is this? That's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk. And because I have four minutes and 50 seconds, I'm going to do it pretty quickly. So I'm just going to summarize it here. It could be due to more efficient star formation and or stochastic star formation. It could be due to ultra low metallicities, which you might expect would beget top heavy IMFs, which can make things more UV luminous. And it could be excitingly due to AGM contribution to the rest of your UV. Am I going to give you the answer to each of those? No, I'm not. I'm going to show you that each of them are plausible. And the bottom line is that if we want to distinguish between these, we really need an even greater investment, um, especially in spectroscopy, but also imaging going fairly deep to high redshifts. So let's go through each of these pretty quickly. This is um, a figure from our most recent paper showing, again, the redshift 11 UV luminosity function here. These colored curves are now all models, and these are from theorists that have now been able to see the JDBC data. And of course, we can make tweaks to our models in various ways to explain those results. And these tweaks are ones I've mentioned, efficient star formation, dust removal, and that's one I didn't mention, top-heavy IMFs, all of these things. So what can we say about each of these? Let's first talk about increased star formation efficiency, linking the last talk to this talk. Um, I have this line where I say models predict that gas densities in star forming regions at high redshift are much higher than those locally, and that should beget higher star formation efficiencies. We heard in the last talk that might not be too local, true locally, so it remains to be determined. Uh, but if that is the case, you might expect then to see higher star formation efficiency at higher redshift. In fact, you should not need to go to redshift 10 to see this. You should be able to see signs of increased star formation efficiencies at redshifts of three to seven. So first I'll show you some evidence that maybe we are seeing that. This is work that's led by Katie Shrowski, who's a graduate student at UT Austin. She looked at the abundance of massive galaxies, uh, stellar masses greater than 10 to the 10 as a function of redshift, really inspired from these early results that showed incredibly massive 10 to the 11 solar mass galaxies at very high redshifts. We did not find those, but what we did find is that from redshift one to four, our results are consistent with a constant star formation efficiency, or really more accurately, I should say, a constant stellar baryon fraction. But as we go to higher redshift, sort of synergistically with what we see at extremely high redshift, the evolution is slowing. And so this could point to an evolving star formation efficiency. Um, you can ask me later why we don't find so many incredibly massive galaxies. Basically, we now know that most of those are actually AGN dominated in the rest frame optical part of their spectrum. Once you remove those from your sample, you no longer have this cosmological <coughs> crisis. So models with uh, reduced feedback or higher star formation efficiency also naturally typically produce increased star formation stochasticity. Do we see signs of that in our data? The answer is maybe. If you took all of the galaxies on the UV luminosity function and sort of scattered their UV luminosities, you would naturally predict that the brighter end would show a higher abundance than the fainter end. And we maybe see evidence of that. This is the plot I already showed you. That's for bright galaxies. This is sort of an analogous plot for fainter galaxies. We don't see significant signs of an excess at the faint end, but the error bars are also much higher. And so as I'll come back to later, more deep imaging should help us there. Um, I'm gonna come back to it right now. That's point number two. More deep imaging will help us do that and also push to higher redshifts. And also deep prism spectroscopy could allow us to do detailed stellar population modeling to better measure star formation histories of high redshift galaxies and see if we can see signs of this burstiness. Ultra low metallicities. Again, a top heavy IMF you would expect to be in place if you had extremely low, maybe pop three type metallicities. Do we see any signs of that? The answer broadly speaking is no, or at least not yet. These are results um, by Alexa Morales, another graduate student at UT Austin, looking at the UV spectral slope beta. This is sort of the color of the restroom UV of galaxies. When things get really low metallicity, they should be really blue. And the one sentence upshot of Alexa's work is we do not see any evidence for excitingly, exotically low metallicities yet. Things are kind of consistent with maybe a few percent to maybe 10% solar metallicities. So at least the galaxies we can see seem to be enriching quite quickly. Now in the literature, there are one or two off exceptions to this rule. And so of course, as we go to higher redshifts, lower masses, fainter luminosities, maybe we'll see a larger population of low metallicity sources. And again, to do that, we need improved measurements of this quantity, UV spectral slope, and we need to go fainter. So we need to be able to take deep spectra of extremely high redshift galaxies to look for signs of top heavy IMFs, like for example, helium-2 mission. 
Finally, what about um, AGNs? As I'm sure we'll hear more about this week, there are lots of exciting AGNs being found, some at incredibly high redshifts of 10 and 11, and a whole new population of these galaxies known as little red dots at redshift 5 to 9. I think I might be the first to mention them this week. These are objects that sort of look blue in the restroom UV and then have this red slope in the restroom optical. And uh, what is sort of up for debate is, what is the origin of the UV emission in these objects? If it's AGN dominated, then that could apply. AGNs are playing a significant role in the UV luminosities at high redshift. On the other hand, maybe there's just two, two components of star formation, sort of a younger component and an older component, and the red slope is in fact not due to AGN at all, it's just due to star formation. So uh, Gene Lung, who's a postdoc at UT, has been trying to look into this using SED modeling, and the key thing that he is doing that is new is he's using MIRI photometry. So he's taking near cam photometry from the primer survey and MIRI 7.7 .7 and 18 micron photometry from the primer survey, looking even farther into the restroom optical and restroom near infrared to see, can I tell whether these objects are uh, sort of dominated by stellar mass only, dominated by AGN only, or sort of some mix of the two. And the upshot is all of the above. They all fit the results. We currently cannot distinguish between those three scenarios. But we can say a few interesting things. The first one is, if you fit them just with stars only, and again, you do need two components, you need a blue component and a red component, okay? The stellar masses are not a problem. They're 10 to the 10, they don't violate lambda CDM. And again, with MIRI photometry, we get more accurate stellar masses and we also get lower stellar masses. Um, on the other hand, if you fit the galaxies with a mix of stars in the blue and AGN in the red, the stellar masses are lower by up to a factor of 100, so then the stellar masses are really not a problem. But you can also fit these equally well with AGN only models, but you do need to make one tweak because we've seen this already that when you go out into MIRI wavelengths, the spectra sort of shallow out more than you would think. So you need less hot dust in the torus than in the local universe. And so if you take an AGN model from the local universe and fit it to these high redshift galaxies that won't work, you need to modify that hot dust component. This paper will hopefully be out on the archive within the month and you can learn more about it then. All right. So I've talked a lot about how we need future observations to be able to distinguish between these. There are a lot of observations coming in cycle three. Um, Meow is a MIRI uh, survey to study obscured AGN at high redshift. This is led by Gene Lung. It's going to get very deep 21 micron MIRI photometry to hopefully improve this SED modeling. Uh, CAPERS is a very large prism spectroscopic survey led by Mark Dickinson. We'll get spectroscopic redshifts. We should be able to do some star formation history observations. And then Cosmos 3D is a huge GRISM spectroscopic program in the Cosmos field that should discover a large number of broadline AGN and given the wealth of data in that field, maybe begin to constrain them. But these are all, on the whole, relatively shallow surveys. Much of what needs to be done requires going to lower stellar mass systems, lower UV luminosities. So that means a greater investment in spectroscopy, particularly blue spectroscopy with near spec at the bluest grading um, and deep imaging as well. So I know I'm out of time, so I'm actually gonna skip this slide just to briefly advertise um, a new center that we've just started at UT Austin called the Cosmic Frontier Center that I'm co-directing along with Volker Brahm. And the key thing for you is that we're planning our inaugural conference in April of next year. Hopefully April 8th to 11th, I have to go view the site next week and then we will lock it in and send out an announcement. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.